The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. entering into the flow of Kingdom River and what God is accomplishing even this year through you individually as well as corporately is going to astound even you. You're going to say, this is what I was made for. This is why I was called by God. This is what was in me all along. But now I am going to fulfill that river. It's going to rise up and be a torrential artesian well flowing out. But the word of the Lord is that I've called you all to be fruitful, but this is going to be the year of high yield return that never in the course of human history has such a small group done so much with so little to so many. And we pray that blessing be multiplied in the hearts and lives of everyone here and in your families and in your your extended families. Even now, that river's flowing out and it's going to touch even the dry and the marshy places. That this this is the year of, of exceedingly great blessings. You're going to be pleasantly surprised. This is going to be the year suddenly, suddenly, not waiting a long time for certain things, but some of the things you've been waiting for for a long time are suddenly, in a moment, in the blink of an eye, is going to come forward. But thus says the Lord, the banner for this year for whosoever has ears to hear the banner year is going to be high yield return use what you have and God will multiply it exceedingly abundantly above all that you ever think it's not how much you have it's how much you use with what you have and the talents that you have will be given in Jesus name amen that's a word of the Lord by the way I didn't I'm not just talking God just gave that to me right now. God said, did you not know that I had to remove from where you were so thoroughly entrenched? If this is a year of Jubilee, I don't know what we were enslaved to. All of us could have different things. But Father, right now, we receive that as a now word that he has delivered me from where I was so thoroughly entrenched. One time God spoke that to me and the things that he said I was entrenched in, I thought were all good things. So it can it's something that you want the Holy Spirit to lay on your heart. He says, I want to bring you into a land where you don't have any resources other than me. And that, did you not know that I had to remove you from where you were so thoroughly entrenched? Isn't that interesting? And yet that was when the blessing started. So Father, we pray that for our missionaries too as well. That there are people that are, that basically when when they feel like they're all alone, that's the very time when God shows himself strong on their behalf. So Father, we just thank you that you are the God that... uh, brings forth the birth in our times of transition. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, two announcements, really. We have six, we just broke the 600 mark for the online school. 600. And only going by emails. By the way, if you're watching by Ustream and you're from a country that I didn't mention, please uh, email to team. Don't email Dennis. Email team. And let us know if we missed it. But so far, we've got students from China, Ireland, United Kingdom, Netherlands, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Germany, Japan, Italy, Canada, Slovakia, New Zealand, Australia, and South Africa. And I believe there's a few more. We're just going by the emails, you know, how they're... um, So if you're in the school and we did not mention your country, uh, please send a text to team embassy to the team it's on our website forgive one two three we have three ministries here and you need to understand jason is in charge of the school i know nothing about the school we just teach in the school our videos all right anything that pertains to the school you send it to team school at forgive one two three i believe um but anyway and here's the other thing that we've that we've launched. We've got a number, uh, I guess we're kind of like a headquarters here. If you come to Kingdom Life Church, you're in the headquarters part because the ministries are much larger outside of the building and that's our intent. That's high yield and return, isn't it? Huh? This little, this little room here is accomplishing quite a bit. So uh, we have uh, house churches. We have Maine, Brad and Carol, North Dakota, Massachusetts, 
Missouri, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Chicago, Virginia, and of course we have Jonathan and Joanne Moon in South Korea, have full stature ministry South Korea. And we're working on getting translated module two into Spanish, right? Ricardo says yes. We have module one in Spanish. Uh, our, uh, one of our, one of our um, people, Nelsie uh, Ayala from West Chicago, is, uh, she's, this is tax season for her right now, and she ministers across her desk. She's got 2,000 Hispanic clientele, and they're all going to get module one, and they're all getting deep relief now, and they're all getting it. And that's, she, I had a friend like that, that he was a CPA. He won more people to the Lord across from his desk than any meeting he ever did. So anyway, that's where we're at now. And also, um, we put a notice out that if you're a member of the school or you've taken our, our books and materials and you've received them and you feel like you're connected in any way, shape, or form, um, call Rebecca. And those of you who are watching by Ustream, call Rebecca. Don't email Dennis. Dennis doesn't type. You will get answers like, okay, good. <laughs> after, you, after you send me a three-page email, call Rebecca. Everybody in the room repeat that back. Call, call Rebecca. Rebecca. Because um, we're, gonna, I'm, we're gonna be doing house schools, house groups. We have house outreaches, we have house churches. So all these categories have different questions. Don't email those questions. Call Rebecca. Rebecca. Call the church number at Rebecca. And Rebecca can transfer those calls to me because here's the way we're gonna do house groups, house schools, and house churches is I'm going to work with anyone that's willing to teach our material and feels I have, they have a heart for our material. I'm going to have at least a minimum of a monthly telephone appointment with them to troubleshoot and help them. If they come under full stature's covering, then they've got a protection. How many know that small groups can be destroyed by one person? Right? One person comes in and then people want to quit their leading a house group because, well, so also came in and they took over. All right, but if you're under us, I love that. That's where I shine. Call me and we'll work it through. And let them know that you're under authority, that you're not a loose cannon that's just out there. Uh, that means a lot, okay? And speaking of that meaning a lot, uh, we have uh, here locally, uh, this is not uh, uh, in other states, but here locally for Kingdom Life Church, we've got house groups that are functioning and, it, and I want to acknowledge uh, two couples right now. Could I have uh, Helen, Pam, and, and Victor, and Ann come up? And could I have all the pastors come up? Dennis, you want to give Rebecca's number? Yes, we should give Rebecca's number. It's on the website. Forgive123.com. It says call this number. That's Rebecca's number. This is what the Lord told me many years ago was going to happen, that there would be two tiers of leadership, that we would keep building and creating leadership. All of my pastors in the back, many of them are from different parts of the country that basically relocated here to be part of what we're doing here. Pam and Hell have a, have a house group, and we just want to commission them this day and really honor them because they've got a heart for helping people, and so does Victor and Ann. And so... Uh, now, Jason's got a home group, but, uh, and Cliff and Stina have a group too, but they're doing uh, intercession, house intercession. The intercession is not done here, it's done in the house, and that way it turns into a home group as well as intercession, okay? But I want my pastors, lay hands on these two folks. From, we're going to get you from the front and from the back, all right? How does my back look, okay? All right. <laughs> but Father, we just, we just, bless, we just bless Pam and hell, and say that, that we, your friends are our friends, your enemies are our enemies, and we're there to support you. We're in relationship with you, and there's nothing that we can't accomplish together. And so, Father, begin that increase even now, that everything they put their hand to, God is blessed. They're going to be blessed in the country, blessed in the city. There's going to be a release of anointing for discerning of spirits. There's going to be a release of every strength that we have in our ministry be imparted unto them, because we're going to be joined together. And again, we say, your enemies 
enemies are our enemies, your friends are our friends, and that we're in covenant, covering, and we're connected. And so, Father, we thank you that you haven't seen anything yet, because there's about to be released a, 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 an artesian waterfall, just a cascade of, of, of wonderful changed lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, we just pray for Anne and Victor, that you who began a good work are continuing that good work. They're steadfast, they're loyal, and they've got a passion and a heart for character development. They've got strong backbones in the spirit, and they're going to see a, a reproduce reproducers in the days ahead. So, Father, we just thank you for this leadership team. We thank you, God, for the quality that's in them. We release that impartation to them, that they're going to see multiplication and effectiveness beyond uh, all that they've accomplished up until now. This is the year of exponential show blessing upon these two couples as well as as others in the ministry exponential means that God's going to not just restore the years the locust has eaten but he's going to restore the blessing sevenfold hundredfold over over all that the enemy has robbed in previous years that what only thing that has been lacking in the years prior to this was God says it was school it was school it was preparation for such a time as this that preparation is now causing you to be of of the mentoring age to where you should be pouring into and saving saving that younger generation from a lot of pitfalls and a lot of mistakes a lot of unnecessary trials and tribulations say that with me unnecessary trials and tribulations in this world you have tribulation but be of good cheer he's overcome this world so father we just release them right now and we ask that your blessing be upon them in jesus precious name amen they haven't seen anything yet amen the, the word of the lord that he's given for for today is the combination of identity and maturity and it, there's, a, there's a, a weakness in understanding identity in the church. And until you do, you become, you become just kind of disoriented. Uh, the illustration that was used with me by my spiritual father was, uh, Dennis, if, uh, if a person went to the emergency room and, because they hit their head, and they ask you, who are you, where do you live, and what do you do for a living? And if you couldn't answer those questions, they would say, you're going to stay here for a while. You're disoriented. Who am I, where do I live, and what do I do for a living? In the kingdom, you've got to be able to answer those same questions when you can't. And what I'm seeing is in the, in the various giftings we have, um, it needs to be organic. You don't pigeonhole and make somebody into your image. You find the gold that's in them and you draw it out. And when it comes to identity, believe it or not, it's not all about you. It's all about him getting his personality through you. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. It's no longer I that love, but his love works for me. It's no longer I who forgive, but Christ who forgives through me. And God is basically saying that here are the four criterias that I believe as an apostolic network we're going to endeavor to work at. It's going to be hard to be part of us. It's easy and it's hard. It's like salvation. It's hard on your flesh, but it's easy to get saved, isn't it? Well, ours is harder because we are emphasizing those things which are not, and we're bringing them into the forefront. What the church is not emphasizing now, I'm emphasizing now, because I like to take those things that are relegated for the future and bring them in the present tense. And what I want to see brought in the present tense is lordship. Not Jesus is my Savior, but Jesus is Lord. And in order for that to happen, I saw four stages. And I was just a, man, I had brown hair when I got this. That's how long ago it was. God gave me four things that when I started my first church, he said, this is what you, whether they like it or not, if, it, if they want easy, they can go somewhere else. But here's the four things that I want you to start. Level number one, you teach them how to locate their identity in God. Secondly, you develop their giftings. The third one is where you're going to, where the rubber meets the road and where you're going to see the distinction. The third element is their corporate identity. Insecure people never cross that threshold. They stay, it's all about me and my gift my identity, who I am, and my gift. If you stop there, you will never mature. These men that we just uh, laid hands on and commissioned, this is a day of commissioning. Many are called, but few are 
commissioned. Do you know that's an accurate translation? We know it as many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few get commissioned. Most just go. <coughs> commissioned is when, actually commission was like when seasoned international pastors met in South Carolina to, we didn't ask them, they got together and said, Bishop Hammond was going to ordain Dennis and Jennifer because they saw apostolic ministry in Dennis. But these are by seasoned pastors, not Dennis saying, I'm an apostle. <laughs> and Jennifer as a prophetess. And basically, when he ordained us, he said something that I never forgot. And we just did it this morning here with Pam and Hill. Your friends are our friends. Your enemies are our enemies. I need that kind of relationship, and so do you. You need to have people that stick with you, not fair-weather friends, all right? You need people that are there for you in the long haul. And I saw, I saw something there that, that really impressed me is because the corporate identity began to emerge uh, even in that relationship and, and still does with many, with many of the peers. But then God said there came a time when he says, you've had respect and honor for your spiritual father. He said, it's time for you to be one and not just acknowledge him. And in, when that broke, and that's going to happen right here in this young man's life very soon, when that breaks, you're going to recognize that, yes, we all need a spiritual father, and yes, we need to know, but there's also a call in us that there's going to be a huge harvest, and this harvest is, can't be raised by babies raising babies. Your peer buddies are not mature enough. There is a net, and the net's going to take mature mothers and fathers. I know Jennifer and I were asked to speak at Morning Stars 50 and plus. I think that's very appropriate. We're, we told uh, Stephen's 49, we told him we'd get them in if they don't card them. But, but that's significant because 50 or plus is basically they should be pouring into the younger people the stuff that saves them the shipwrecks that they will do if they just ask their buddy. How many know? When I was in school, me and my buddy, we knew everything there was to know. <laughs> right? That's not the best source. The best source is to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the children to the fathers, to make ready a people prepared to seek the wisdom of the just. Wisdom is what we need. Wisdom is application of knowledge. Knowledge is fine, but wisdom is the application. I even heard somebody told me that, guess what? Someone's trying to do what you're doing. I said, who's that? She said, Joyce Meyer. She's changing her whole ministry to teach you how to do it. I, that's what I feel is relegated for the future, but needs to be brought into the present. It's... I believe that even some of the some of the best teachers that are out there, quality teachers, they name the tools, naming the tools, the blood of Jesus, the word of God, decree, declare. We all know those are the tools. Show me how to properly use the tools. That's different, right? If I handed you a bunch of a toolbox for a plumbing, a plumber's toolbox, and just said, I named them for you, that's still not going to make you a plumber, is it? You're going to have to exercise it, use it, find out how it works. Application, application, application. So anyway, listen to these four things. God took me as a baby pastor and said, individual identity, then cultivate organically their individual gifting. Four worship teams, four dance teams, flags, banners. It looked like a circus in that church, but 80% were actively engaged in the building. I'm not interested in that anymore. Everybody's doing that. For me, that's already been there, done that. What I want to do now is activate you for the 90%, 98% of your life is in the world. It's in life in general, school, work, home. V only 2% of the, of the on-fire Christians were called to full-time support as a vocation ministry, 2%. So God's basically saying, I want to develop their identity. Jesus' manhood was developed for 30 years, for three years of ministry. Some people want to develop their ministry for 30 years and their manhood maybe spend a couple months on all right? Your character is primary. And 
God said individual identity, individual gifts, but here's where the rubber meets the road. Can they be mature enough for interdependence? This country was built on a rugged individual, and that's a good thing compared to being sickly dependent. But just because rugged individual is better than sickly dependent doesn't mean you've arrived. Because I did that, nine years old. I wouldn't go in the shoe store with my father because my friends might see me and think that I'm a sissy. This is, this is street talk, and it's crazy. Nine years old, dad, give me the money. I'm going in by myself. I don't want anybody to see that my dad had to take me in to get shoes. At nine, that's ridiculous. Then you come into the kingdom, and he turned it upside down. And he says, no, no, your maturity is going to be how dependent you become on me as your father. God is your father. And you're going to be dependent, not independent. So you can get fired up in the church, become independent, and God says, but you don't have a corporate identity. When you think about what is a corporate identity, the first place that a corporate identity starts is if you're married, husband and wife. The beautiful thing is, is that God... And at my age, we're living in convergence. Convergence is the best of what you've done and accomplished is now being used with very little effort. I'm not tired and I'm not worn out from ministry. And I'm probably dealing with more people than any one of you are dealing with even at work. But the difference is it's convergence. It was God that got us to this place. And I look at Jennifer. Jennifer goes, without you, I would have nothing to write about and without Jennifer, none of us, none of the things that God showed me in the spirit would be in books. Convergence then was, I'm going to put that one and that one together and make a new creation out of them. A new creation means something that never existed before. Husbands and wives, you're not enemies at each other's and you're not competing with your giftings. You were put together to find a convergence to where you become an expression of Jesus together and you don't have to be the same. I deal mostly with the people. Jennifer does mostly administration. It works that way. I do the laundry and she types. I mean, it works, it works that way. It's a cooperative effort. Now, Jennifer is brilliant in a lot of areas, but math is not her strong point. I handle the finances. It's co co cooperation. It's called co-laboring. It's called coordinate. It's good co. All right? And it blesses the entity. And it is a new creation. When we got married, it didn't exist. I had my gifting. She had her giftings apart. We didn't, we didn't somehow lose our identity because we got married. No, God brought new meaning to it. And here's what the Lord said many years ago. If I can get the church to go to corporate identity, here's what the world will see. Corporate identity means, uh, he showed me like if you had a bunch of loose grapes and they're just rolling around on a plate. They're grapes. Nothing's changing the grapes. But if you were to look at those grapes and you would look at a cluster of grapes, there's something in the cluster that speaks more clearly of the order and the design that God has. That's corporateness. God is looking for the cluster. There's an anointing in the cluster. And this is not the season for how many Lone Rangers can we have. All right? This is the season for can you be part of something bigger than yourself? And God's basically saying that corporate identity will then release corporate gifting. But in my first church, there was very few that were able to get to the corporate. I believe now I'm going to see it happen. But very few could get to the corporate identity. It was still pretty much where do I fit? What do I, that's, you know, when you say where do I fit? Where do I belong? What's my gift? That's insecurity speaking. That needs character development. The condition is that God is basically saying, I've appointed the exact time and the exact place in which you should live. Understand your jurisdiction, because God basically plants for the purpose of growth. The conditions of people who don't ever get planted. Uh, in my first pastorate, we used to use the terminology, uh, this was in uh, 
Pennsylvania was in mall mentality. In other words, I can't just buy everything from Sears. I've got to go to Penny's, Sears, shoe store, Kinney's shoe store, then I'm going to go over to Nordstrom's, and then I'm going to go to Belk's, and then I'm going to because you're afraid you're going to miss something. And what God is saying, what you're missing is more often than not, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. That God has appointed the exact time and the exact place in which you should live. When I came down here and I left everything that was familiar with no plan other than I know that I know it was God, go to North Carolina. When I got here, the miracle started happening. When I left Pennsylvania, I had uh, half a dozen pastors I met with every week. I know where I went to the grocery store. I know where I went to the gas station. I know where I got my hair cut. You th those things are not bad in and of themselves, but you know what? You can accidentally depend on those things more than God. Why consult God? When you came here cold with no plan, all you had was God. He showed himself strong on your behalf, but you've got to be able to risk not being so comfortable You've got to risk stepping out and taking a chance. And God is basically going to come through. The condition, however, for the exa I had a Russian missionary walk up to me. Uh, I was attending Morningstar at the time, and uh, a Russian missionary walked up to me, didn't know me from Adam, and said, didn't even know I, was a, I, I had just come into the area. She says, God has appointed the exact time and the exact place in which you should live. I was in the right place at the right time. It was not what I would have picked. You hear me? The difference is knowing the voice of God that what my spiritual father taught me was that knowing him was more important. Knowing how to obey him was more important than all the externals. But he said because what he had taught me was that even in the corporate setting, he plants the solitary in family. So if you're single and you're, I'm talking about married people, don't think it doesn't apply to you. He plants the solitary in families for the purpose of being in the right place at the right time for the right purpose. The conditions of people without roots. Jeremiah 17 says, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. Yikes. He'll be like a tumbleweed in the desert, unable to see provision even when it's right before his eyes. Is that possible? If you have an agenda, it's possible to not see the provision right before your eyes. <clears throat> what I found for believers, the hard place, and this is the hard part of the message, if there's no depth in their life, character, there's no root. No root, no depth, no root, no depth, no fruit. That's just a kingdom principle. Want to hear that again? Because this, you, if you're ever in charge of people, you, that's what you're going to see. You're going to evaluate. You're not judging them. You're just clearly seeing that tumbleweeds do not mature quickly. No depth of character means there's no root. No root means they have no depth. No root plus no depth means there won't be fruit. I don't know about you, but we're going to be fruitful, multiply, and increase. So basically, God's going to have to teach us how not to be unstable or irregular um, and be an accident going somewhere to happen. Now, <clears throat> here's the part that needs to be mixed with all of our equipping, with all of our gifting, mix this. And that is that, remember the story of the 10 lepers? Only one of the 10 lepers came back to worship Jesus after being healed. One in 10. Those who prophesied, cast out demons, and performed miracles in the name of Jesus were not even known by him. You know what he means by that, intimately. I don't know you. Did we not cast out? Did we not work miracles? A mature, loving, united family in an ever-increasing nature change 
having the character of the Father, this is the miracle that's going to change the world. We need both. It's not gifts versus fruit. It's gifts and fruit. And when they're combined, but think about that. Uh, God's looking for a united, loving people. But what did he say to those people? He says, depart from me, you who work lawlessness. Lawlessness is unrighteousness. In other words, I'm doing what I want to do when I want to do it. And righteousness is actually God's love in action. That's the definition, New Testament definition of righteousness is love in action. Now, here's something <clears throat> that really stuck with me early last week. Our authority in Christ, and this is what I want to see rising up in all the believers, your authority in Christ has little to do with shouting and decreeing. Well, that'll fool all charismatics, won't it? It has little to do with shouting and decreeing, but rather it's in direct proportion to how well you're known by God. Remember the seven sons of Sceva? What did they say? What, what did the demons say? Paul I know, Jesus I know, who are you? And then Jesus said, even in working signs and wonders and prophesying, depart from me, I know you not. Real authority is based on how well you are known by him. And that requires relationship. How well am I known by him? Here's the corporate identity though. 2% are called to ministry as a vocation. I already shared that. 98% secular work, full-time homemakers, whatever. But the equipping for everyday life in the family, work, and school. I'm seeing with our house groups, house out... We've got so many names because there's so many various giftings. We've got five full ministers. That's really what you amount to. In the, in the marketplace. You have outreaches. You have schools where they say, I just want to take uh, live free and teach it in my house group, like a facilitator. I'll play the DVDs if necessary. Do you see what you're doing though? You're, you're drawing out reproducers. You're drawing out people who are actually ministering to people. Do you know by now what we call that word? Discipleship. You don't just win them to the Lord, you disciple them. That means you train them up. When we were ordained, and in my first church, this is before Jennifer knows this, I had prophets come, and they would hand me a sheet that would go back to their overseer, and I would evaluate how they, what their manhood was like, what was their character like, what was their ministry like, was it effective, what was their message, was it biblically sound? Were they mature? What was their marriage like? How about their methods? What were their manners like? How well did they handle the subject of money? What was their morality like and what was their motive? And I'd send that back to them. I'll tell you what, I loved having prophets come in that would be willing to say, here I am, I'm in full-time ministry, probably longer than you, Dennis, but as a pastor and you're responsibility for your congregation, here's this sheet to evaluate me and send it back to my superior overseer. That's not legalism, people. That's maturity. And that's a fearlessness about what other people say. I saw a, such a beauty in that that one time a few of us pastors had the same prophet come in um, in our region. He went to five churches and we all supported him. And we saw that it was taking a toll on his marriage. And on that sheet, I was honest. I said, I think there's a little bit of problem with the marriage. He needs to spend more time with the wife if she can't travel with him. That was my recommendation that she could travel with him. She homeschooled and they, they traveled like that, and the, the, the wife was in ministry and homeschooled the kids and found out that when that letter went back, three other pastors wrote the identical thing. The overseer said, I think what you need to do is basically spend some time and work on your marriage and go work secular. 
And he did. And when he emerged, he was flipping hamburgers. Now, here's someone that we saw some of the telltale signs because when he'd go on a missions trip, he went to, with, uh, don't, I don't want to go there. All right. Anyway, we, they, we saw some signs of immaturity and was called on it. His overseer put him down flipping burgers, working in a minimum wage, fast food place, he did that for six months, and when he came out, he was ten times the man that he was prior to that. Ten times the man. Greater anointing, greater efficacy in, in ministry. You build the man before you build the ministry. You don't do it the other way around. Your, your gifting can get you places that your character can't keep you. But God basically showed me and him, that was a small price to pay. Then what happened is that, that corporate, corporate gifting just flourished in him. I want that for everybody. I want leaders. I want people that are people helpers. I want five full ministers in, the, in what you would, we would call the marketplace. We need apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers. But there's going to be a huge harvest coming, and you can't have babies raising babies. Do you agree? We've got to have mature mothers and fathers that are going to be able to disciple them after they're saved, not just turn them into the same kind of people that they are. Is this a hard message? This is for all those people on Ustream. You people don't need this, all right? All you Ustream people... The shoe fits, wear it, right? Do you believe that we're coming into the time and the season, though, where we're going to have to grow up before we go up? Full stature, my mission, even with those 10 M's, manhood and maturity, I believe that if those are emphasized, all those other M's kind of fall into place. A real man will take care of his family financially, his marriage, he'll love his wife, his Christ, love the church, etc., etc., etc. If you take care of the first two, full stature, grow up, and you cannot grow up spiritually beyond what your emotions allow you. It's funny, Jennifer and I were in a store one time and we saw a guy carrying on in a grocery store. And he had a three piece suit on and was jumping on his tiptoes. Face was beet red. I'll never shop here. Nobody should ever shop here. And Jennifer and I looked at each other and we went, damage, age three. <laughs> that stuff stays in you, in an adult body. And you know what? One of the things that our, our leadership team has learned is we don't have emotional issues here. Emotional healing is as easy as breathing. Tapping into the fruit of the Spirit is easier than prophesying. You can tap into the fruit of the Spirit at will, and you can train others to do the same thing. That's not popular in the church. That's yet to come. But what I am is a forerunner. I want to bring those things that have been relegated for the future and bring them in the present tense. And I believe that character and the fruit of the Spirit is what we're going to have to teach the people to tap into. And we've got all types of training modules that will basically work to that end. Because what we're teaching now to make ready a people prepared, to make people who are, know their God and shall do exploits, both. They're going to know how to tap into the fruit of the Spirit, but the key that we're actually teaching is so simple. How to make Jesus Lord. We have many, many Christians where Jesus is their Savior. We need to show in a practical way what would it look like if Jesus was Lord. And... I'm convinced that this message today is really for the seven mountains. And I'm looking forward to a book that's coming out in April by Don Norai Sr. because he uses that title, The Forgotten Mountain. Everybody know How many know what the seven mountains are? You've all heard the seven mountains of basic pillars of society. Uh, you know, those are, uh, uh, you know, media, government, education. 
society in general has all of those pillars to make a society work. Education, government, media, family, religion, et cetera, et cetera. You need to know what mountain you're called to is the essence of the, of the teaching and what the hindrances are in those mountains. And I've said, I've said it all along, and I'll say it again. There's the forgotten mountain. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And until you discover and conquer the seven internal thrones, you are not equipped for those seven mountains, even if you know what mountain you were called to. Being called to the mountain is not the same as having the lordship of Jesus saying, now it's time to give you your mountain. You can take that mountain because you are under authority. You have authority. The forgotten mountain is really Christ in you. Even, even as Don Nora uh, uh, said in, you know, how they give little, little parts of a book before it's out. He said, everything in charismatic prophetic ministries, now Pentecostal, everything is externally oriented. Now, he formed destiny image from a word from the Lord that prophetic information needs to be released to the body of Christ because up until that point, most of the books were evangelical. So that was his calling, to get prophetic, charismatic, Pentecostal-type material out to the body of Christ. That was his call, and he's done that. But he's also said that in observing there is a forgotten internal mountain of Christ in you, the hope of glory, that the emphasis has been, well, think about it, really. And this is all legitimate. I've had it all happen in my ministries. Gold dust, feathers, slain in the spirit. It's always happening to you from the outside. Think about it. Is it legitimate? Yes. I'm not saying it's not, but in a sense, there is going to be a new mindset that will have to change and transition because he even used the term, that's a wilderness mindset. In the wilderness, what did they want? Manna, quail, everything came from the outside upon you. Promised land attitude, not wilderness attitude, promised land attitude is Christ in me, the hope of glory. I don't need to know if he hears me. He always hears me. I don't make long distance phone calls to heaven. Christ in me. He's always with me. I'm not waiting for him to come upon me. He's in me. Can you see the transition? Both are legitimate, but making the transition is going to t change a mindset. Jennifer and I sat in congregations of well over a thousand people and saw 98% Prove to me that we need this. I would say, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Where's Jesus? There's something wrong when you say, Christ in, in me, the hope of glory, and 98% of a congregation points to heaven when you say, where's Jesus? Do you think we're going to be in transition? We need both, right? But here's, here's the part that I see. In Proverbs, there's a scripture that says, words, are we good at confessing, proclamation, decree, declare? Church is pretty well trained in that, don't you think? Pray the word. But in that, it says the words are like a mighty rushing river. But the wisdom of God is like an artesian spring that springs up. If you haven't heard anything, you really don't have a lot to say. I want the artesian well that rises up and comes out of my mouth. I don't want to just say the right answers. I've seen more people shipwreck saying the right answers or the Christian thing to do. Whenever you say the Christian thing to do, most of the time you're operating from your intellect, not from your heart. I watched, uh, who's the guy from South Africa? Rodney Howard Brown. I liked his statement. He was, in, he was doing a meeting at SIDS and he went, this is your head. This is your heart. Big difference, huh? I was like, we've been doing that for decades. Decades. And then the better one was Paul Keith Davis. I love this. We appropriated this. Because people get, all their theology gets all mixed up, especially with forgiveness. They say, forgive and forget. Or I don't want to talk about that sin. Uh, Jesus forgot it. No, it's called a 
testimony when you talk about what is done. The question is, like Paul Keith Davis does this good, he says, this is the historical record. This was in a conference where we were all teaching about the gut. I started it and got them all going on the gut. And Bob Jones was up there going, the fruit of the looms. Okay, the fruit of the loins. The fruit of the loins. The fruit of the loom. And then Paul Keith Davis went and did this one. This is up in uh, uh, Brian's church. And then Paul Keith Davis said, this is the historical record. This is the heavenly record. This is where it gets forgotten. It does not, God's not amnesia going, what, what, what happened? What, who are you, Dennis? He's not having a senior moment. My God is omniscient. This forgive and forget stuff gets, people get so screwed up. With, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want, that's a negative confession. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about, well, let's talk about the fear that you're operating in right now while you're talking. God didn't give it to you. What are you doing? Talk about, oh, oh, oh. If you've got to go, oh, oh, to say the right thing, you're already wrong. You're in the wrong kingdom. You need to translate it out of that kingdom of fear. All right? So. The historical record is there for what the scriptures say, for reproof, for correction. So you don't do it again. But the beautiful part is anything that he washes out here. Christ the forgiver on the inside takes your pain and your sorrow. He replaces it with the divine nature, his presence. So that means if I talk about how goofy I used to be, and I used to do drugs, someone on drugs, this carries a divine nature. I can talk about the past from the place of anointing, not talk about the past because I want to glorify the devil. That's just bad teaching. I ain't glorifying the devil. I'm actually, I'm actually spitting in his eye. That's what a testimony. I overcame by the blood of the lamb, by the word of my testimony, and I love not my carnal life unto death. That's spitting in his eye. That is not, I don't want to give the devil any glory. I don't want to give it the, you know what? Maybe you ought to get a testimony. Maybe you ought to die to something so that life can rise up out of you. I, to, I love being in the factory. God, called, My mountain is religion. And I, to be honest, I know that's where I belong. But at the same time, I had more fun in the factory. I just loved it. Because I watched them beat up on Christians. And I'm going, I ain't going that route. <laughs> now, I'm not saying you have to do it this way. But I had more fun. I was a time study an industrial engineer that time studied welders working on tank cars and stuff and they were trying to distract me first they would cuss and swear because if you're a Christian you're supposed to go run away when they cuss and swear because that's what they saw happen I was, they'd cuss and swear and I'm going did you learn that in your church why, why don't you leave that God stuff at home I would use everything that they used on Christians and I had so much fun who taught you to pray like that, Is that was that a prayer for that hammer, that sledgehammer was what? And you're doing what? Where'd you learn that? And then I'd kind of say, was that in the Catholic church? Was that in the Protestant church? Where did you learn to pray like that? Why don't you leave that God stuff at home when they'd cuss and swear? And then they'd show me centerfolds, naked, naked centerfolds from a Playboy magazine or some little magazines that all the, all, the, uh, all the welders used to have under their workbench. And they would go, I'd be taking a time study, and they'd go, what do you think of this? Uh, is that your daughter? <gasps> you shouldn't be showing pictures of your daughter around like that. And I, <laughs> I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Then they wanted to see what I thought about alcohol. So then they'd go, ah, Denny boy, needs to be smoking a cigar. <laughs> right in your face of course uh, you know when I get home I'm going to have me a half a bottle of scotch pour a little milk in there for my stomach uh, well well, Artie I think that that milk's going to hurt you it's not good for you drinking all that milk and it's just playing with them and they don't know what to do and eventually eventually what they do is they will see what you're made of by your response, not by
by whether or not they can beat you down. Why would you want to tell the world that greater is he that's in them than that's in you? Why would you want to be evangelized by that? I'm not saying you have to do it my way. That was in the factory. That was fun. <laughs> my best one was, was in my day, you know, in the 70s, they had the headband and one earring, and they wore the headband, and he was the maintenance drug dealer, supposedly hijacker. This is a trucking firm and all kinds of things, and he sat, and he was the, the uh, foreman for the, for the uh, motor pool for the trucks. And he sat face to face, and I can still remember having fun going, look at your car. It looked like it had cancer, holes all over, rust holes, Pennsylvania, mm, salt on the road. And he goes, your God can't even provide for you a decent car. This car's not even going to pass Pennsylvania inspection. Look what I got. And he took off an expensive watch, smashed it against the wall, and said, I can go buy another one. What's your God doing for you? So I went, I had, I had a free New Testament that you're not supposed to, not saved, not for sale. I had a free New Testament. And I went, yeah, you never bought nothing from me. And he goes, what do you mean? I got this Bible here <laughs> that's not for sale. <laughs> How much do you want? Five dollars. And I said, unless you're afraid of it. I said, watch out. And he bought it for five dollars, put it in his desk. And then, make a long story short, I'm not going to get into this one too long. It was fun. I took him to a meeting where I was the speaker, a Christian businessman's lunch. And he shook <laughs> this guy next to him going, I was in a helicopter crash. An angel saved me out of the helicopter. This guy's over here going, oh, yeah, I had a near-death experience, and I went to heaven, went to hell. And he's sitting between the two of them, and then I'm up there, and he's going, like, <laughs> this is the tough mechanic, head foreman, macho, tough guy. And, and then finally, um, God says, you're done here. I administered to these, to these uh, primarily three foremen. You're done here, and I got a phone call. Right after he says, you're done, I got a phone call that a job opened up in the factory again, a machine that paid big money that I had done that nobody bid on it. And the steel workers didn't, nobody bid on it. It's open then outside of the uh, others. And they said, well, we have a record where Dennis Clark ran this machine. So they called me up. But it was after God told me your time is done here. I left there and I heard stories that the next guy came in. The first thing they asked him, they go, you a Christian? And he goes, Yeah. But he'd smoke, he'd smoke pot with them, too. And found out a week later, they said, you know that guy that replaced you that said he was a Christian? They hung him on a hook where they take truck engines out. They hung him on the hook, and they all stood around in a circle and said, we had a Christian in here. You ain't one. <laughs> it's kind of like Jesus we know. <laughs> Paul we know. Who are you? You're not for real. I believe that what God's raising up, he's raising up people that are going to be equipped for the world, for life, where you spend 99% of your life, not inside a building. People call this, they say, oh, we're going to go to Kingdom Life Church. And I go, I always tell everybody, I'm going to the building. This is still a building to me. This is not the church. The church is people. I never call this, I'm going to the church. I'm going to the building where the church meets, the ecclesia the called out ones, assembling ones. Are you ready for radical, 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 exponential blessing in your life? And mark my words, I'm not, I'm not, I've got a real deep peace about this thing. You're going to hear from these two in the days ahead, um, from Andrew and Janice. They've got a calling on their life and they're going to do it. I'm in transition, and most of you are in transition, but this is a year of Jubilee too. This is a year where there's change, yes, but there's going to be a whole lot more. Let's just, uh, let's just drink this in right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just want to absorb the fact that you who began this work in me are going to continue this work. And God, I believe that you have given me the exact time and the exact place in which I'm to live and that you're bringing together something and you're orchestrating a tapestry that's exceedingly abundantly above anything that I would ever come up with. God's saying that it's not going to be in the shouting and the decreeing. It's going to be in how well you're known by God.
So, Father, I want that I might know you, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of your person. I want to know you as Lord in every area of my life. That forgotten, that internal forgotten mountain, all seven thrones, I'm welcoming you to be Lord. Not, you're not just my Savior, you're Lord. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. I'm going to ask the Lord to just have us as a congregation to bless the corporate endeavors. You are part of something bigger than yourself. And I want you to pray and release blessing to the next two books that we're doing. Actually, two books and a workbook. Uh, we've submitted them uh, to Sid Roth uh, and the other one for Destiny Image by March. But I believe these books are getting response from around the world what change lives. I don't know about you, but if I, was, if I wasn't seeing changed lives, I would just have to be an evangelist because I can't handle not actually seeing fruit. I really don't know how some teachers teach and teach and teach and never see results. They start forming a theology. You know what their theology becomes? Oh, well. I've not seen it, so God mustn't want it. That's what God wants us to pray right now. We need an instant faith detox. People that have had loved ones die and not get healed, you build up barriers on your heart. You start the process of hardness of heart. Fear, doubt, and unbelief. You get a doctor's report that's negative right? There's the anointing right there. That is not the word of God. That's a doctor's report doing the job the best he knows how to do, that he's not God. Let's receive forgiveness for taking in any, any negative report. Where did that get started, God? Where did I give up on healing? Where did I quit praying in the spirit? Where did I quit believing for healing? Where did I quit prophesying? Where did I quit? Where did I quit? Where did that start? Father, right now, this is the word of the Lord for today. If you forget everything we've said up until now, this is time for instant faith detox. Instant faith detox right now. How many? Slip up your hand. You can see something that's been a barrier. God's already given you something that's a barrier. Father, right now, this is going to be a miracle service right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, there it is. I receive forgiveness. I repent for having allowed that hardness to come in. I receive forgiveness, and now I am back under the authority of the Lordship of Jesus on the inside, and it's rising up. Now, how many feel that it broke? Feel that it broke? You removed the barrier? You know what the next step is? Replace it with the truth. God, what's the truth? The enemy shall not return a second time. I'm hearing that for somebody. Nahum 1.9. The enemy shall not return. If there's a sickness or a disease that's been recurring, take that word. Nahum 1.9. The enemy shall not return a second time. It's just like when they no longer saw the Egyptians after they crossed, after they crossed the Red Sea. Hmm? You've been battling with it for a long time. If you identify that, lift up your hand. I want to see. Okay, you've heard it over and over again. Take it. I receive right now. The enemy shall not return a second time. And you shall live and not die. There's somebody actually being afraid that they've got something terminal. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I receive forgiveness. For the word is saying, I shall live and not die. And I receive forgiveness for allowing a death report to come into my heart. It's a barrier. I receive forgiveness. The authority of the Lord Jesus on the inside. I'm rising up. Father, I thank you. Thank you. Relationships. There's relationships that have actually pulled you away from the things of God. You've got a relationship that's pulling you away. It's, you need detox. You need to be set free and be your own person. You need clean on the inside. That heavenly record in the gut's not clean. And you already know it's a wrong relationship because, quite frankly, you feel uneasy about it. Any relationship that you consistently feel uneasy and it's intermittent. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I receive forgiveness. Break that supernatural, spiritual, evil tie 
that seducing spirit. There's a seducing spirit with all soul ties, all emotional attachments that are not healthy. I receive forgiveness for that right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Stomach problems. Uh, that's in this room. How many have stomach issues? That's in this room. Right there. Father, right now, I am welcoming Christ the healer on the inside to touch. There you go. I'm going just by discernment, but it changed in the atmosphere. So that means you receive. And what you receive, you welcome. And here's, here's the key. I want you to look at me because this is not done in church enough. Here's the way faith works for me. Faith is inner assurance that God is there, right? Hope is holding my heart open. When it comes to physical healing, I never shut down. You know how to open your heart here? Is your heart open to receive? So you're welcoming healing. This is for the ones where it's not instant. I open my heart to healing. I'm going to walk out of here. I don't have to think about it constantly, but I will never shut down. Shutting down is hope deferred. It will make the heart sick. You'll harden your heart toward the healing. We've watched our little children. We've watched Mandy's kids get better healing by being patient, more patient than adults. The adults, child will show you how to hold your heart open and don't shut down just because something's not happening on your timetable. Hope deferred or hope shut down. Hope and open is synonymous. When you open your spirit, you're staying in hope. And what are you hoping for? You could make a formula, faith, hope, love. It's not those three are going to remain forever, even in heaven. Faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest is love. Faith is God's assurance. Hope is I'm holding my heart open till what? Till love comes through. Love never fails. Do you have that kind of patience? Fruit of the spirit of patience. That's the way God taught me the fruit of the spirit of patience. Jennifer was amazed at how something could be bad for a long time and Dennis holds the heart open. Because I learned that it's like rebarb. You know what rebarb is? Reinforcement. It's like to the degree you hold your heart open believing that God's coming through. Don't tell him you got to come through by Thursday because you'll shut down on Friday. Right? Hold the heart open and like rebarb, the fruit of the spirit of patience builds strength. And you know what's neat? I can outlast the devil. <laughs> patience can outlast the devil. And quite frankly, how many years? I keep saying 40 some years have been in the faith. I've never burned out or got worn out. And I don't plan on starting to now. But you know what? You have to hold your heart open because love always comes through. And I've seen a lot of devastation as a pastor over the years. I've seen a lot of people's dreams crash and burn. But I've never seen love not come through for whoever's heart was open. But it has to stay open. We committed for that today? Father, from this day forward... I'm going to learn that anything that I receive by faith, anything I minister by faith, I am not shutting, looking at circumstances and then shut down. When you shut down, you actually close the door to God. I'm going to keep my heart open because love never fails. Love will come through somehow, but he does not have to come across in my way, my time. Right? Amen. This feels good. Feels good. Janice, you have a word? You sure? Okay. She's got probably the best word of knowledge I've seen in a long time. And he's one of the best teachers I've seen in a long time. Next to me. <laughs> now, all, of, all of you stream just heard that. Yeah. They're all praying for, oh, Lord, humble that man. Humble that man. The, don't have to pray humble me. I have Jennifer. <laughs> She will always keep my feet to the fire. All right. So remember, if you're interested, if our material has changed your life, because that's what we're hearing reports from from around the world. They say, I've been in the church 30 years, but your stuff has changed my life. And I want to teach it. I want to help other people. Then you can become part of a house group with us, and I'll maintain phone contact with you at least once a month. Some of the churches even more so. 
not by email. And the key to getting through to me is call Rebecca. Amen. 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 You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.